Anybody have any idea what a zephyr is? Well, I suggest you go look it up so you can sing that song correctly. <laughs> because they're floating on the breeze. Give you another little Bible assignment. Because I've sung that song all my life. How are angels going to sing a redemption song? You ask yourself that question. Redemption means you've been purchased back. I'd like to know how they have the authority or the right to join in a redemption song. The Bible tells me that the angels that sinned were what? Cast down and chains of darkness. Just think about that. Of course, we got real concerned a long time ago when I was a boy about Beulah Land. Because it used to be saying, I reached the land of corn and wine. Somebody got real concerned about that, and they changed over to the land, reached the land of love divine. But I guess they forgot about the zephyrs and the, and the other part of it. You know, one of the greatest dangers we face, and I, I'm just using these for an example. There's a lot worse things than that in the world. Is that what I said about this morning in class. We do things over and over and over again, and we do it all our life, and our parents did it. And it's just part of us. And we don't really even think about what we ought to be thinking about or even think that, raise any questions about it. But I think it's worth if you're going to sing like, here I raise my Ebenezer. Well, I've seen a lot of folks raise Cain. And nowadays, I don't know whether they know any more about raising Ebenezer than they do raising Cain. <laughs> Although a lot of them do raise Cain and don't know what they're raising. Now, that's not my lesson, but I could easily go on with that, but I don't want to. I'm going to go back to John. John chapter 4, 35 through 38. John chapter 4, 35 through 38. Now, in getting to that, I want to emphasize that we all recognize Jesus is the master teacher. What does that mean? Can't get any better than that. You can't get any better than that. And in his teaching... He has taught us so much about winning souls. After all, what he came to do was to seek and save the lost. And he did all that heaven could do to save me, just thinking of it personally, to save me from my own sins. And so it was for all, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. He did that by setting the example in his own life. And in doing so, he taught us the importance of compassion. I think the world has always been very low on compassion, but nowadays, when you look around about you, worldly people, and sadly some those who claim Christians, don't have much compassion. Compassion is when you look at somebody in a terrible shape of some sort or the other, to one extent or the other, and you feel bad for them. That's the best way I can describe it in common sense terms. You want to do something to help. Sometimes you can't. But your heart, we would say our heart goes out to them. Our Lord made it very clear that that was the way he thought about all mankind. He had compassion. Can you conceive of Christ coming without compassion and going through all that he did without being compassionate? Also, by way of instruction, he teaches us the importance of prayer. You look at that in Matthew 9, 35 and 36, and in that same chapter, verses 37 and 38. And there were many other things regarding evangelism that we can glean from our Lord's pattern of life on earth and what he actually had to teach. On one occasion, Jesus taught his disciples a very important principle of sowing and reaping. Now, surely we have enough knowledge of agriculture to realize that you have to have the ground properly prepared to receive the seed. No matter how good the seed is, how strong the germ of life is in it that God put in it, but it takes both of them together for the seed to sprout, for it to grow, for it to finally bring forth whatever it produces. And here in Samaria, where we left Jesus last week, 
Following his discussion with the woman at the well, John 4, 28 and 29, there apparently from the scriptures, people were making their way out of the city to come and see Jesus, John 4, verse 30. And as the crowd was making their way, as Jesus often did, he would take things around them, what people were doing, just simply the scenes around and teach. And at this time, he told his disciples, starting in verse 35, Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They're already white in the harvest. And then in verse 36, he said, He who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who rejoices, or he who reaps, may rejoice together. John 4, 36. He then in verse 37 says, For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. And that's the title I'm giving this section of verses 38 through 38. One sows and another reaps. But in verse 38 he went ahead to say, I have sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored, and ye have entered into their labors. There is, we say a lot of time, mouthful there. Our Lord is saying so much that we need to know if we're to be effective in spreading the gospel. Much of it is personal evangelism. I would say nowadays that if we reach many people to the point of being able to study with them and convert them, the way things are in general being done publicly throughout the land, it's going to take that kind of personal involvement of each Christian with those not Christians before you're going to get their attention. I told Jody I'd probably use this uh, as illustration of how our society has gone. But at the snow cone stand this past week, she came telling me, said a fellow came up and was looking at the times we were open and so forth and noticed that there was nothing there for Sunday. And he very casually said, well, wouldn't Sunday be a great day to be open when you have a lot of business? And she pointed out to him about going to church and so forth. I asked what his response was and said nothing. He just looked awful funny which means I never gave any thought to anything like that. When I grew up, it would have been right the opposite. Some of us remember when you had blue laws. Anybody know what a blue law is? You don't open on Sunday. Look how it swung in that last less than 70 years. Look how it's changed. Of course, that's mild. But the change is there. But we still have the command of our God as members of the church to teach people the truth. And the truth Jesus is teaching here is still just as true as it ever was. One sows and another reaps. Jesus said that's a true saying. But it also shows us how that we all don't do the same thing. And that what we do when under the authority of Christ, as the Word teaches, and I'm now specifically thinking of converting people to Christ then when we're involved, there is a, a sowing and there is a reaping. And it may involve different people in the church. Things change in the church, and it's not all for bad, but there was a custom back in the 19th century to where you would have a preacher who was very good in explaining the Scriptures. And in his sermon, and it might be an hour or two hour sermon, he would be going over things and explaining but then when he closed the service, another one who was noted for his powers of exhortation would maybe spend 15, 20 minutes exhorting the people to respond to the truth they just heard. I don't see that much anymore. Not that that was right then and we're wrong now or vice versa. It doesn't make any difference about that. A long time in the churches when people took the Lord's Supper, then they used one cup. I mean one container. When they gave it their means, they'd actually file to the front and leave it on the plate on the table. There's some even, as they filed out, they left it in a container there. So there's different things. 
You've got to remember, when you have the obligation, according to circumstances, situation, and even culture, depends upon what's the best option to choose whereby you get the thing done. And we become so uniform, a lot of those things don't cross our minds. But sowing and reaping is a part of the Christian's faithful service to God that can never be dispensed with. It's obligatory. So we can see some valuable insights into the process of winning souls to Christ when you look at what Jesus taught here in John 4, 35 and 38, long ago back there in Samaria. And it was all based upon his own teaching to begin with, with the woman, then what she did when she went into the city, but that's not all. The process of sowing. Now, in agriculture around here, you're not going to see much but row crops. That's why they came up with such terminology. You prepare the field, you lay off the rows, you go down and open up the rows, if anyone knows anything about that, and uh, you then plant whatever it might be in there, and it has to be so far apart according to the nature of the plant when it grows, and the farmer's supposed to know that. So some things you plant in hills, like a hill of squash, you actually say that, or a hill of watermelons, or a hill, hill of cantaloupes. Sometimes people have lost all, all proper terms to refer to doing that. <laughs> Nevertheless, you, you prepare the ground according to the nature of the seed. But now, back in those days, they didn't have that many row crops. I don't know of anything about the way that they basically sowed uh, what they did in the sense of row cropping. In fact, the word sow basically has what my grandfather would call broadcasting. Of course, we always had a turnip patch about as big as the side of the bog torm over here. And, and you would learn to reach down and get the turnip seeds, and you'd take a step. You'd, Okay. Because I always got tickled when it all come up. You'd see big strong clumps here and it'd be thin over here. But those that were good, they scattered it pretty well. And lo and behold, we have a song saying, Scattering Precious Seeds, by the way. That's where all that comes from. So it helps to understand some things about the way things were done then to better understand the spiritual message as it applies to us now. It just has to be because all that was set into history and that set into people's lives as they were then, not necessarily as they are now. In winning souls to Christ, the ground must be, Luke 8, 15, proper if it's to bring forth like it ought to. And that takes usually a lot of preparation and a lot of planning. If you went back to the early beginnings of this country, there was new ground. I remember my grandparents talking about new ground. That's where you got trees and saplings and bushes and everything growing. You go in there one year and you cut the whole thing down. And you ever heard about pulling stumps? Well, they had to get stumps up. And that's new ground. Finally, they get all that stuff out of the way. And then they can take a big breaking plow. And a big team of mules. And they have to be pretty big. And then you go down through and break that thing. And if you've gone over it, you have to go through and, and hit it with a disc. And then usually you harrow it and so forth. You're getting that ground ready for planting. And then you've got to go all the way through and lay off your rows. Nowadays the way we do things. And they still do it. They just have tractors today and all the implements that go along to it. Now, when you talk about getting people ready to receive the engrafted word, hearts have to be prepared. And a lot of times we do a lot of teaching and preaching, and we don't see a lot of results. That is, people being baptized. But I think people have just simply forgotten what it takes long before you get a person into the water. There's a lot of preparation. And if you look at our Lord's teaching in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he did a whole lot of teaching on the proper disposition of the mind, the proper attitude. And so the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount has the be attitudes, the beautiful attitudes. And if people don't have those attitudes, those mindsets, then the Word of God may be just like a bullet glancing off a rock. So there are those people who whose hearts, the inward man, are first introduced to the gospel. Now, one reason 19th century proved so wonderful in the conversion of souls is because people had for a long time lived very close to the Bible. 
you would be hard pressed in the early days of this country to go into any house and there wouldn't be a Bible there. And they read it. That's true, they were in the mold of denominationalism, but they still believed their denomination followed what the Bible taught. And so they still believe the Bible is where we learn what God wants us to do. So when things really got to flourishing in the early 18th, uh, 1900s, or rather 1800s, with the restoring of the Bible as a final root of faith and practice, people were more ready for that. It's not by accident that they, that took off in the first part of the 19th century. So a lot of time, a lot of teaching, a lot of influence, with a lot of visible results, many times it's involved in soul winning. In agriculture, reaping is the harvesting of what has been sown. But after the thing sprouts, or you set out a tomato plant, there's quite a while between the sprouting and the tomato plant before you ever get a tomato, before you ever pick a bean. It takes a while. Yet all that goes on from the time of getting the ground ready, the seed, right kind of seed, it germinating, it sprouting, the sunshine, the rain, even more fertilizer, tilling of the ground to keep it, whatever, all of that. And you go on for days and weeks, sometimes months, before you are able to get the fruit of whatever it is. If you have a fruit tree, especially this is true, of uh, peach trees, because everything in the world is trying to eat them up. You have to start spraying them while they're still in the bud back before they're ever put out. And then you have sprayings at times through the time of their blooming and then the bud and blooming and then on so that you can get a peach off of a tree <laughs> something hadn't eaten it up. And it's amazing to me that we can see those things. But yet when it comes down to soul saving, which is what the church is all about. That we don't realize how long it takes sometimes. And we're not really prepared to move from a time when the ground was far more conditioned to receive the seed, such as in the early part of the 20th century and the 19th century, to a time where we're basically sowing the seed on concrete nowadays. And so that fellow the other day who never thought about Sunday as being a time to shut down and go to church. He just thought it was a good time to make money. And there's America. Right there. Never give any thought to anything like that. So we are working with folks who may have already heard the word. Uh, but then you may be working with people who have decided to obey the word. A process involving conversion with great joy and excitement, of course, then, as it ought to be over one who obeys the gospel, the results of all this kind of thing. But are we prepared to take those steps? Are we prepared to work continually without seeing visible results? But you see, if you're going to raise a garden, you do. If you're going to raise soybeans, corn, or whatever in hundreds and hundreds of acres, you do. Look at all of the work that goes in to pro producing any kind of thing we eat. It takes a long time. Yet all that work we do, if we do it properly, is needful. And so it is in saving souls. Both sowing, what all is involved in that, and reaping, unnecessary to win souls. And the two aren't always done by the same person. A fellow came up to me after the Catholic debate and said, there's one thing I feel sorry for you about. I said, yeah, what's that? He said, you'll never live to see the good results that will come from this debate. You may never know about them. Well, I learned a long, long time ago as a young preacher that my job is to live the Christian life as best I can and preach the truth without compromise and defend the faith. The rest of it is up to you. It's sort of like our freedoms in America. Your freedoms end where my nose begins in the same way going that way. We would all do well about that when it comes to a whole lot of our rights, 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 rights. Or as the old Southern says, rats, 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 rats. We do very well realize it's not all about just my rights. Because your rights end where my nose begins. 
And my responsibility to teach the truth and try to save your soul through that truth ends where your responsibility begins in wanting to learn it and have a right attitude toward it and doing what's necessary to know it. Now that's the difference to a great extent. When it comes to sowing the seed of the kingdom over and sowing a mustard seed, big difference. Because people have wills. They can determine what they're interested in. They can be reasoned with. I don't think a seed of corn can be reasoned with. But you can people. And the prophet said, come let us reason together. So we may reap where others have sown. This was the case in Samaria. Verse 38. Remember Jesus sent his disciples to reap, he says, where others had labored. Now who had done the sowing? Well, verses 5 through 26, I mentioned earlier, Jesus had done a lot of it in conversing with the woman at the well. He so upset her and got her all beside herself. She couldn't be quiet, which might not be something new to a woman, but she went all the way back to a town and was telling everything. You know, this is one time she, she did what she should have done, went back and told everything. The woman in telling those in town about Jesus then was doing what? Sowing the seed. John 4, 28 through 30. Show us a lot better than talking about our neighbors. The disciples were to benefit from the sowing done by others. Well, I say this is often the case today. There are times when people are, we'll just use their term, ripe, ready to be reaped ready to obey the gospel, requiring little effort on our part because of what somebody else has already done and they've already benefited from it. And they've grown to that point. And this is likely then due to sowing that occurs some other time and all that's involved as far as that's concerned. It might have been from a friend. It might have been from family. Who knows? But it was done in the past. To which they did not respond at that time, but they're ready at this time. Brother Woods told me of a case back in the 1930s where he had been in a debate with a Baptist preacher in the West Texas community, four-night debate. And he came back five years later, which was the way he set up his meetings all his life, as far as I know, it was a special situation. And he baptized this fellow, or at least this fellow was baptized at his preaching in that gospel meeting. And the man came up to him after it was over, over with and said, when you held that debate, with the Baptist preacher. I was converted to the truth then. But I was Baptist. All my wife's people were Baptist. All my family was Baptist. We were very active in the Baptist church. So I could not bring myself to obey what I now knew was the truth. It took that long. We don't, we're not guaranteed anything like that, but that does show very definitely that people change. Besides that, once you become a member of the church and your growth and develop as a Christian, you know what it's like to grow and to develop, to make sure that you're making every day a time to study the Bible, think about it, and to pray, and to do those things God expects Christians to do. And you have to reorient your life. It's called conversion. It's called changing the way you look at things and the way you plan your days. So we often benefit from the sowing done by others. I don't think we should ever have the idea that, well, this person I just baptized, that was all my doing and nobody else had anything to do with it. We should realize God, when he put together the church, called it a body, and each one of us members in particular, and then Paul even reasoned that we all have different assignments, different things to do. And while they're so different, maybe from what the little finger is to the nose, I'd hate to do without either one of them. So reaping doesn't always reflect where the hardest work was done or how that work was done. So we need to be careful lest we boast too much. And I hear a lot of preachers saying, well, <clears throat> we baptized so many in this meeting, in this meeting, and over a period of years I've baptized 300 and whatever, or baptized 1,000 whatever. Well, what was going on that ever brought them to that meeting at that point? Maybe they were first time they ever heard the word was converted right then when you preached it. Not apt to. One of the reasons the meeting system worked so well years ago where everybody knew one another in smaller towns, 
is because the brethren, by studying the Bible, were into it in Bible studies with their neighbors. And they were discussing these things all the time about the church and about salvation. And thus people would come out and listen. And a lot of teaching had already been done before they heard the gospel preacher through several nights in a gospel meeting. So we may sow where others will reap. I never give any thought to something like that. I don't know what's going to happen. Some of you young people sitting here, I don't know what you're going to do 30 years from now, 40 years from now, 20 years from now. What I don't know what you're going to do. But it may be that I can say something or I can set an example that will cause you to think 40 years from now. Well, I remember old Brother Brown, such and such and such and such. I remember him saying from the pulpit, I can do that right now. I memorized Galatians 3, 24 to the end of the chapter by listening to Brother Woods one night speak on that thing, and he quoted it, and I listened, and got through, I could quote it. Well, I don't know why that happened that way, but I could do it, and I've been able to do it since then. <laughs> I could, couldn't tell you. The thing of it is, we have an influence on other people, and that influence will be for good or bad by the way we conduct our lives. So this was the case here in Samaria. Jesus did the sowing. But his disciples were doing the reaping. And the woman is of sowing. Then Jesus' his disciples did some reaping, John 4, 39 through 42. In this case, the sowing and reaping, though separate, occurred close together. All the time, it's not that way. It can be, and sometimes is today. Now, this can be misinterpreted. Those sowing with little visible reaping may think they failed. I think that's one of the best things the devil can use to get you to quit or maybe never start. Because you've tried to do this, you've tried to do that, and it goes on month in and month out, and year in and year out, and you don't see any results. All you have to do is ask yourself this. Am I doing what the Bible said in my daily life? Am I studying it, and am I teaching people what they need to know as I have opportunity? Am I trying always to reach them? Yes. Then forget about worrying about it. You're doing what you're supposed to do. But we let these things discourage us. And this causes us to be tempted, and that's just what the devil wants us to do, to seek to be involved in trying to reach others. Others may think those who sow with little visible reaping are really failures. There's always somebody trying to make you think you're a failure. That's all the way around the country and the world as far as that's concerned. When you don't baptize a lot of folks, say, well, then you're not doing what you ought to. That does not mean that. It does not mean that at all necessarily. So we all need to be diligent in our efforts, but we need to have sane enough minds and knowledgeable enough of the Bible to know when we're doing what we can, where we can, according to our several abilities, and we'll take advantage of more if it avails itself. So failure to reap does not always reflect the hard work being done to reach souls with the gospel. When the uh, efforts to sow appear to produce little fruit, we shouldn't hastily draw the wrong conclusions. It can only lead to discouragement and possible misjudgment of others, and we set a bad example for the rest of the church and the young people. The key to Christianity is stay with it. That's it. You know you're right? Fine, keep doing it. How do you know you're right? I know my Bible. Does the Bible say you can know what's right? Yes. Well, know it. <laughs> Somebody says you can't know it. Know it anyway. I don't care what the other person says. Study and know and act upon what you know. When you see you're wrong, change. That's life. The Lord never expected any more out of us than that. So one sows where another reaps. And that's a very important principle in trying to reach others with the gospel. We need to be diligent in it, diligent in sowing, because the Word of God will accomplish what God wants us to do. Used to, we used to hear this probably said a lot more. I should be more mindful about using it. But in Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11, the great prophet said, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, and then this, 
so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. That's the reason we've got to listen to Paul when he says, Preach the word. We've got to study to show ourselves approved, to make sure it's the word we're preaching and not what we think so. And we've got to be concerned enough to study it for ourselves and study what we've heard in the light of it. But one thing for sure, when the Word of God is preached, it doesn't return void. It may be that it reacts with some people due to their poor state of minds, like Pharaoh, just hardens his heart. But it doesn't harden his heart against his will. It hardened his heart because he didn't want to do right in the first place. And that may just simply set him apart in that way. Other people who are disposed to receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word make a difference with them. You can reach them. So we should be very diligent in these things. We should have great confidence in God that he will give the increase. And that's where we end the lesson. Because it was Paul himself who said that he sowed the seed and the polish watered, but it was God who gave the increase. The power to save is in the gospel. And we're held responsible as the church under the Great Commission for constantly living it, preaching it, and defending it because that word will not return void. So as we reap, then be mindful of the contribution of others. Of course, that includes God. And rejoice together in the work of the Lord. And be happy that everybody's doing what they can where they are according to their several abilities with the idea in mind that we're trying to save souls. That's why I'm here. I'm saved to save others. There's no other reason to be here but saved to save others. If you need to obey the gospel, and we urge you to do that this afternoon, to believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of your sins. As a child of God, if you've wandered from the way, if you've ceased to be what the Bible says you ought to be and you know you ought to be, then we urge repentance upon you that you'll confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. And now's the time to obey the truth if you need while we stand and sing.